Franklin in New England. The racing that all of us here came to love, to know, and make our number one sport in the Greater New England area. Speedway in the Northeastern area, ladies and gentlemen, fight craft.
by the way, they're at the booth. They're one of our strong supporters. They're at the booth while everybody's dining here. They're running things over there for us. Uh, George uh, had a few misfortunes this year, lost one of his trailers, but uh, really appreciate George and all the work he's done there. I know George is working hard. He always is. Thank you. Really giving his all for making this club work. How about a round of applause for Hoppy Jensen? A few years ago, I had the pleasure of going over to Poppy's house and uh, he invited me over and he said, I want to show you something in uh, the garage. We went out in the garage and my amazement and everything else was like going back into a time zone. Two perfectly restored, not restored, two perfect conditions of stock cars. The 179 and the 79 were in his garage, minus the motors. And boy, when I ever seen them two cars, my heart just jumped up and down. Right, Hop? <laughs> on behalf of the near club, uh, one of our strong supporters, uh, we have the young torches, having of uh, engine expiring at Thompson. And uh, here you look for Barron for the car, it's getting ready for uh, May, we hope. Yes. Special Barron for the GMC with Hoppy Jensen. Hoppy, thank you very much. Thank you. I have uh, Paul, George, on uh, behalf of the club, with your support, restoring the uh, Danbury car of uh, Hoppy Jensen and uh, putting a nice flathead for that. Yes, he's done such a good job. And George, uh, along with Big Club Green, are building two 1933 coupes to restore those for this year's uh, event. So George, thank you very much. with defining eyes. Green has never been a racing color. But when you put green with the number 870 on the side, George Clark was a winner. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. George Clark. Since I can remember as a little boy and everything else, I have never called my dad dad. Very, very few occasions I ever called my father by that there. I, so, We've had a relationship for years and everything else. My name was Sparky and my brother was Champ. And we always called my father the Chief. And that's the other the only thing that I ever recalled my, my father was Chief. And he started green car, I guess, uh, 1950 with the Cavana Oldsmobile and went to Daytona Beach. And from there he came back with the green color of the 70 of the Messi Brothers out of Meriden. And uh, people used to say to my father, why the green car? He says, well, I don't get paid in orange money. <laughs> my dad was never superstitious and everything else. I'll tell you, my dad's not a car, but I'm a talk to the family. But dad, for support and giving me uh, all the incentives to uh, get going with the near club and uh, the old timers, uh, it's been an honor to uh, restore a replica of uh, your car. And I wish I had the real, the real one, but I think it them up so much. <laughs> Uh, we was waiting to get the money, you know. And so I said to John, I says, come on, pay us. He said, we got to wait for the truck. You keep the truck and give me the money. For our second year of the year, Jack and Ward, this year, it is going to be presented to a gentleman who is unable, for obvious reasons, to be with us. He resides in Winter Haven, Florida. He was one of the top New England competitors, his son following his footsteps racing in the Florida circuit. The recipient is Mr. Art McBurney, who did show up to the Thompson meet in 1982. Accepting the award for him will be Mr. Moon Burgess. Good morning. 
I think we're going to have to get our summer weight jacket because he won't be the winter weight jacket in Florida. Right? I guess I'll get this jacket. It looks too small. <laughs> Boom. What do you think? Can I have the Jimmy ready? That's right. <laughs> Boom's uh, trying to restore a replica of the uh, Fontana GMC. And it uh, looks like I'll put a few guys together. We'll come down and uh, pitch in. You'll get it. Over. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's Come on up here, Al. He's opening it now. We took care of that. We have it up here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a replica of the number one hard rebound of the ball first. It's the very public of Al of your country. A year ago, a year ago, Joe didn't even know the club existed. But I went over, uh, I wanted to get active, so I needed a place to gut a car, and he had a, a yard that we could throw the rubbish in, etc. So I stopped by and he said, uh, uh, he said, sure, bring it over. We started it, I was telling you, and then Joe and a couple other guys, and before, uh, before five, well, about two months went by, they took the whole car for me, and I just kept up. Now they're totally involved in the club and working on all the programs and etc. Like I said, a year ago today, they didn't know the club existed. Thank you very much. A gentleman who drove a car known as the Red Ram number 21, Georgie Lombardo. An individual who's, uh, congratulations, Army, on 50 years of auto racing. We'll see you soon. Sorry, but previous commitments, Ernie Gaham. <laughs> Over the years, I'm sure there have been many people in this room who have been with Harvey Heathersall on many, many occasions as either a carpenter, a driver, a mechanic, we try to select a group of individuals, give up, talk for a few moments, relate some of their experiences that they had in auto racing over the years before we bring Harvey up to make the presentation of his award. First of all, I would like to call a gentleman from Wilmington, Massachusetts, who has been a United Stock Car Racing Club official since the inception of the club. He began his career in auto racing in first as a sprint car owner and driver. He finally retired from auto racing in 1976, holding the position as chief scorer and handicapper at the Riverside Park Speedway. From Birmingham, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill Wine. Thank you, John. The only story that I can remember was when we used to go up to Rutland in Burlington, Vermont, put on a show up there with 10 automobiles. You bring out the first heat, you hit the 10 cars, run the cars back behind the fence, change the numbers, <laughs> bring the 10 cars back out again for the second heat, run them back with them again behind the fence, change the numbers and the driver's names, bring them out for the third heat. When the main event came out, with only 10 cars in it, People wonder what happened. Well, the other 20 broke down in the pits. That well, I could tell 101 stories like this, but I'm not going to. It's great to see all the people here in attendance to honor this great gentleman. And I can't think of a better person to receive this award. It's been a pleasure working with Harvey. Thank you. A man who probably spent six out of seven days a week traveling from racetrack to racetrack, and on the seventh day, Harvey called him and said, Hey, Paul, 
I got to have somebody fly for me in the odd night, and he was there. His career in auto racing spanned over 10 years. He was the chief flag man at Riverside Park, the Eastern States Exposition, Stafford Speedway, Plainville, Manans, West Haven, and Candlelight Stadium in Bridgeport. And I probably forgot a couple. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Alaska. Thank you. First time I made my car he was about 39 at Century Stadium. And I said, there is a job I'd like. And I kind of stuck around a little bit. And when he went in the United Stock Car uh, Association, he appointed me as a pit steward. And I went up through the ranks and later on became a starter. But the story that sticks in my mind, and I often wondered why he hired me, and I found out why, at Candlelight Stadium. It seems that we had a... Uh, situation there where we had more cars than Bill talked about the 10, and we had to run time trials. And uh, this fellow was from the Bridgeport area, he came in a little late, and Harvey said, you just can't run. This was one of my first events down there flagging for Harvey. And uh, he said, Harvey, I have to run. He said, if I don't run, he just says, nobody runs. And he brings out a tire iron. And, uh, had a twinkle toes, he uh, sneaked behind Big Paul, <laughs> and he kept shaking his finger. And I always thought he hired me because I was smart, and I was big. <laughs> but so many nice things happened with uh, working for Harvey Tattersall. I, I went 22 weeks doing eight shows a week, starting at Riverside on Saturday. Sunday afternoon at Stafford Springs, leave Stafford Springs, go to Plainville for the Sunday night, Monday morning, uh, Monday Manance, Tuesday back to Riverside, Wednesday, Savin Rock, Thursday, I can't remember that one, then back to Candlelight, and we went like this, but I never ran any show that wasn't a pleasure working for Harvey. Harvey, congratulations on your 50 years. Ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to bring up a modified driver who really needs no introduction. He's won feature events up and down the eastern seaboard for over 20 years, probably even longer. He's still active in auto racing. He runs his own auto racing shop in Manchester, Connecticut. He's driven cars for numerous power owners, builders, mechanics, one of the finest in the business. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. Eddie Plumpy. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure, Harvey, and thank you, Luke, to be part of this thing. Um, Harvey and I go back a long way. I was, uh, last night, laying on, put my head on a pillow and thinking about what to say today. You know, for a person who don't do this too often, it's pretty tough to do. Uh, if this was a roast, I could have had a ball with it. <laughs> it was 4 o'clock in the morning before I finally put my head in the pillow and went to sleep. Harvey and I would be able to say go back a long way. I don't have to talk about that because it's here, him we're talking about, not this guy. So many things it enters in my mind to what this award means to this individual, what it means to me. When we first went to the races, when I was just a young lad, less than $2 to get in the pit area. And it was $2 to get in the grandstand. Insurances, I don't think they're too much different today. We made more money back then, and it was the young, the young fellows next door were over here listening to what I got to say. Because we made more money then, and we were only paying $2 to get in. He kept the equipment down at a low cost. He never let anybody go ahead and change the rules. He was the boss. Yet, at the time, we could always sit there and debate with this man, anything. A lot of times I didn't win. And the first time, I guess, I had an association with the man, is I got thrown out of the pit area. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a license. 
<laughs> I don't even have a driver's license. <laughs> I mean, memories like this with this gentleman goes back years and years. But all I got to say, Harvey, congratulations. And I grow up a lot since I got married to you. started under the Tanner Song United career near Riverside Park. He started off first in the novice division. Very quickly found out that his talents were far above racing in a novice racing class. He moved to the late models. He dominated that division. Damn it. It's a pleasure to be here. And I don't know really what to say to Harvey. He's been super to me. He's been super to a lot of people. Uh, I started there, I finished there, and I enjoyed it here. Thank you. Probably one of the most unsung heroes in stock car racing. A man who can win a race on any racetrack there is, and definitely one of the most formidable competitors in the Northeast, Mr. Billy Greco. Another veteran of the early days, Mr. Kerry. 
Carol Sleeper. <laughs> to the next one. He's laughing now, but he realizes. <laughs> now he is, quote unquote, the promoter of the Stafford Motor Speedway, Mr. Ed Harrington. Going back to a track that recently existed from being one of the weekly stops here in New England, Mr. Mark Burns. And who for many, many years drove a car, only car, and competed against the quote unquote overheads while he still ran his flathead, Mr. Walt Cole. A gentleman who started with 21, brought to the legendary fame throughout the early days of stock car racing, competing up to about probably five years ago, and correct me if I'm wrong, but had every top driver that ever ran at the Waterford Speed Bowl behind the wheel of his red, white, and yellow number 21, Mr. Dorn Pies. I'm doing too much of this. Your turn. Ooh. That gentleman there was an innovator of his time, originally from up in the Massachusetts area, Ed Trella. Another one of the uh, local area gentlemen that I've known for quite a few years, and the uh, builder and uh, co-owner of the Lion Zero, Dexter Burnham. The Chief Wrench and co-owner of the Flying Zero, Jimmy Jorgensen. The gentleman who has uh, run a car consistently uh, since, I think, 1954, still has a car to the present day, George D'Alessandro. Another gentleman from the present day car, but he's in a uh, super modified, Beast Harbor, Connecticut, Skip Matzik. Gordon Ross. And one of the Jimmy Builders took over after the Fontanas moved to California. And last very <coughs> Walt Smith. And then out of the Danbury area, a gentleman who has <coughs> a near supporter right off the bat, presently uh, in with the Southern New York Racing Association, a long timer. Old timer, Bo Conrad. And a gentleman who's been around the racing And John the third, last uh, late bill champion. Black last late bill champion. A gentleman, a gentleman who knew how to drop the flags at numerous racetracks, Al Parent. Gentleman out of Springfield area, one of the only cars uh, besides running horns on the roof. This car here ran springs on the roof. <laughs> a lot of names, and uh, my eyesight is not that great here. How I can forget this one here was the uh, another gentleman, 500 winner one time at Riverside Park, the Wall of Beer. Harvey Tattersall was the founder of the United Stock Car Racing Club in the late 1940s, and during the some 30 years span, sanctioned as many as eight tracks per week on New England's pioneer stock car circuit. Although tracks like Riverside, West Haven, and the Eastern States Exposition remained as the mainstays throughout the 1950s and 1960s, Harvey and his United Stock Car Racing Club traveled throughout New England, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, sanctioning stock car racing at Speedway after Speedway. United sanctioned the first race in Malta, the last race at Old Ridge, New Jersey, developed a traveling late model circuit that saw the top New England competitors competing at the JFK Stadium in Philadelphia to some 70,000 fans. In 1975, he purchased the Waterford Speedball, 
and in 1976 began devoting his full-time effort to the promotion and management of Waterford, ending a 27-year career at the Riverside Park Speedway as racing director. As a racing director, Titus Hall was an innovator, constantly aware of the changes within the auto racing industry, and an outspoken advocate of controlling car owners' costs long before they became the issue that they are today. To assist in today's presentation of the Frank Morata Memorial Award, the new organization thought that it would only be fitting to call out several of Harvey's friends and racing associates to remember what could only be a handful of the thousand memories and accomplishments that made up his first 50 years in auto racing. Before we bring up our first speaker, we have several individuals who were unable to attend here this afternoon. I just knocked over our place card. <laughs> Ed Clark has telegrams from three individuals who want to be here this afternoon, who could not, due to prior personal commitments, be in attendance, but Ed, you've got them, and if you could read them, and then we'll bring up our first speaker. I have a gentleman uh, talked to and he expressed something to me, a few things on the phone that go way back to hard. Uh, I know this gentleman personally, and like I always say, he's always like a second father to me. From so money bags, Mo Guernsey, best wishes hard, and 50 years of auto racing. This is going to the crash house. See you soon. Money bags, Mo. <laughs> Another gentleman that had a long association with Harvey. He says, really upset that he couldn't make it. He says, Harvey, congratulations on your 50 years. Sorry, but cannot attend. Best wishes, Ed Patnow. <laughs> and he was really upset that he couldn't be here because he had to be changed his crash helmet for fuel, uh, pool stick. He's competing in a pool term tournament today with 500 to win. It says bad things, and I don't think anybody knows any more bad things about them than I do. <laughs> because we, uh, he lived near me. Even when he was in New York, he was living in New York, I used to go to his house down there. So uh, he finally came, he got sick, sick and tired of me going down there, so he moved to Bridgeport. <laughs>
is what it appears to be here. I sense it last year when I visited Riverside for the first time in many years, and today, here at this old little crowd. I was asked to come up and say something about Harvey Tattersall, the honored guest. I'm at a slight disadvantage because they said what they wanted to do was roast him. <laughs> uh, that would put me at a disadvantage because in order to roast him as an old man, I only qualify halfway. I'm old. <laughs> the fact is that I've known Harvey for quite a few years. I don't know, maybe 30. And we traveled millions of miles together, it seems. And in all those miles, but if you see how well Harvey has, the years have treated Harvey, it's a good reason for that. We travel from, say, uh, Rhode Island to New York City, and he slept all the way. <laughs> and I drove. <laughs> and then I'd leave him at his home in the Bronx, and I'd drive downtown New York, Manhattan, where I live, and I would be in the door five minutes, and he'd be on the phone, and he wanted to talk for two hours. <laughs> I'd say, Harvey, how about tomorrow? I'd say, tomorrow we're going to Albany. And he'd sleep all the way to Albany. <laughs> I didn't even think I was going to make it here today. I actually left a, a sick bed. My secretary hasn't been feeling well. <laughs> <laughs> after, I, after I spent so many years with, I'd say the first five or six years with Hobby, I was able to observe him. Uh, I'm married and I'm childless, unfortunately. I felt very badly about that. Because after I saw how Harvey operates, I said, God, if I only had a boy, I would pattern him after Harvey. Because at least I know he'd never be in need of a fuck. I'm supposed to say something nice. So I said, well, let me recruit somebody. Let him come up here and say it. So the first one, of course, I approached was the one man president, Buddy Krebs. I said, Buddy, you think you'd come up to the mic and say something, you know, after all, we're honoring the guy, you should say something nice. Buddy said, well, I would. You see, the way I was brought up, my mother told me, if you can't say anything real nice, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> well, obviously, he's not going to make it. <laughs> I can tell you, they say, the people that preceded me on this platform had many things, many nice things to say about Harvey. And I'm sure that some of them meant it. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you things, little stories that happened to us because we traveled so much together. There was one where we were operating the Hitchcock Stadium in Patterson. And one afternoon was not a race day. We stopped at our the house of our public publicity man, who also happened to be the sports editor of the local paper. We stopped in and talked about the show that week. He made some notes, and he offered us a drink. And he got out some kind of scotch that nobody ever heard of. There was about two shots left at the bottom of the bottle. And considering what we were paying him, we thought we weren't being treated very well. At this point, his wife walked in. She said that, we said, we're leaving. She said, why? There's no more scotch. She said, what do you mean? She went down the cellar, came up with a Johnny Walker black label. So I looked at Harvey, he looked at me. We were one thought. We'll get even. So we drank the bottle. <laughs> we started in New York, and I was driving at that time a Ford Alike. It was one of the first Fords with Cadillac engines. The year was 1950. Got down to Washington Bridge, and as usual, my partner alongside of me, sleeping. <laughs> so I pull, I pull up to the toll gate, and naturally, I know we've been drinking. I'm not interested in discussing anything with the police. So I kept my mouth shut and waited. The guy in front of me is talking and talking and talking, and Harvey comes out of the ether, and he looks over, and he blows the horn. So <laughs> I said, stop it. The guy in the booth looked out, and now Harvey's doing this. <laughs> and he goes, 
goes, don't do that again. So he goes back to talking. Oh, he comes out of the easel again. Bang with the horn. The guy jumps out of the booth and walks up to me. And he reaches over and he says, if you do that one more time, I'm going to lock you up. I said, officer, really? He said, you heard me. He turned around and walked away. Hardly comes out of the easel and says, yo, boy. <laughs> the cop turned around and he said, what did you say? I said, officer, I didn't say a thing, honestly. He said, if I thought you said what I thought I heard, he said, lock you up right now. I said, thank you. We went back in, went back to talking. Holly comes out of it again, blows the horn. Now the cop from this booth comes over. The cop from the other booth comes and he comes over. Now I got two cops. And they're both yelling. And Holly opens his eye, looks over and says, You're both falling. <laughs> With that, I got the money, but they wouldn't take it. So I threw the money at them. I went over the bridge at 110 miles an hour and got away with it. <laughs> and that's one of the little incidents that happened when you travel with old heart. <laughs> I could say that many, many things have happened, of course. Like when I first met him, the first year or two, everybody used to call him Honest Tar. <laughs> I figured everything must have a basis. So I started checking around. Why do they call him Honest Tar? It took me a few months of asking questions, and I finally got the, the background. It seems now one day, he found a glass eye. <laughs> he took it to the pawn shop, and they wouldn't give it anything. He went around and tried to sell it, nobody gave him anything. He gave it to his son, who took it to school. And the kid came back and gave it him back. He said, don't you want it? The kid says, nah. So he only saw one thing he could do. <coughs> he gave it back to the book, a man that lost the eye. And since then, he's been known as Honest Heart. <laughs> confrontation that actually happened and you may find some humor in it. We were in partners and we had placed ten thousand dollars in a safe deposit box to bid for a stadium the following year and these safe deposit boxes are rather long and narrow with a lid. So the time came to go up with the cash. So I said to Harvey, let's go get the money. So we go over, the two of us signed in Went in, got the box, got into the private room, opened the lid, there was nothing in it. Now, I want you to know, that's as close to murder as you can. <laughs> he looked at me and I looked at him and we were at once thought, what did you do with it? <laughs> he said to me, all right, Tom, what did you do with it? I said, don't all right me, buddy. What did you do with it? And with that, I picked the box up. I actually just tilted it and the money came rolling down, and we both smiled. <laughs> we were one inch away from that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was visiting you in London, at uh, Harvey Racetrack. I did find out something that surprised me. They, it seems they have a very bad plumbing problem in New London, which I was unaware of. The only reason why I found out I left the track and I stopped downtown to pick up some cigarettes. As I was coming out of the, the little shop there, I heard one girl say to the other, she says, I've been walking around all night and I can't find a John any place. He was doing 70 miles an hour. He said, I never was doing 70 miles an hour. I was doing 50, 50 miles an hour. I know what I was doing. Because you were doing 70. And with that, Helen leaned over and said, Officer, don't argue with my husband when he's drinking. Harvey <laughs> <laughs> was always known in many years of John by as being quite a ladies' man. And I know that years ago, he used to try to set up six girls in one night, six dates, go from one to the other. You can imagine. He was a guy that really believed. <laughs> I know, I know from asking around that the first girl, she really gave her a hard time, but the rest of them had a pretty so. Hobby, <laughs> <laughs> Hobby's logic goes way back. He always believed.
believed in sharing. And anybody that's been around a racetrack knows that to be true, don't they? He always believed in sharing. So when he took a girl out, he always bought a big dinner, tickets for the show, and the rest was on her the rest of the night. <laughs> and Holly was never one to uh, be tongue-tied or not have an answer. One time, Harvey, of course, being so quick with the quid, Helen once said to him, that's his wife, what would you do if I told you I'm having an affair with, an affair with your best friend? And Harvey, without even thinking, said, I'd say you're a lesbian. <laughs>
with all the wonderful people in it for the rest of my life. And I feel blessed that I have reached this point and I'm still in the business and I hope to be in it for a long time from now. I look around and all these old fellas, I know we've had such good times together. And what makes it more important is, I don't think anybody in this room has at one time or another said, I'd like to kill the son of a bitch. <laughs> So much fun. In spite of, you know, it's a business and we, I made a living out of it and uh, I've had a very good living. I can't complain about anything. But it's been fun. It's been fun for everybody. You have to admit, all of us have to admit, we've never had so much fun with our clothes on. <laughs> but be that as it may, over the years, I've learned a lot from everybody, and I owe everybody in this room. There isn't a man in auto racing that I am not indebted to. That without his help and his support over the years, I couldn't have made it. I wouldn't have been here for the 50th year. I'd have been long gone. But I owe it all to you. I just want to say one thing. I'm not going to keep you up here too long while I talk. I have learned about sportsmanship from you people. I have learned that winning isn't the most important thing in the life. It's just that anything else sucks. <laughs> so, on that note, I just want to thank you very much. If this is a night or an afternoon, rather, I will never, ever forget. Thank you. God bless you all. May you all be